Jesus. Let's see your Bibles tonight. Word. Let's see your pens, pens. Let's see your bulletin, your notebook. Bulletin. Please turn to 1 Samuel chapter 24. 1 Samuel. Welcome all the visitors to the rock. God bless you. Y'all excited? Y'all like dancing around? I love to see y'all dance around. See you'll be so happy. We're actually going to Africa tomorrow for a few days to visit some orphanages, speak at a church Wednesday, so you can pray for a safe travel there and back. Looking forward to it. Um, 1 Samuel 24. When, um, when I was 19 years old, I worked in Brooklyn. And every day, my supervisor would pick me up in Queens. And we would drive about 40 minutes to this uh, neighborhood in Brooklyn where we would we're fixing some streets. We work for an engineering firm. I was a student, and he was an engineer, and I was in training. And he was the worst driver I ever been with in a car with in my life. Uh, every day, I feared death or getting in an accident. We never talked in the car because he was too busy cursing at people and yelling at people and running off the road. It was really horrifying. He smoked cigarettes the whole time. And by the end of the summer, I, had, I didn't never smoke a cigarette, but I put them in my mouth and just. <laughs> but uh, whenever we would show up, whenever we would get there, you would get there or get back to the, where he would drop me off and I would catch the bus. He would go, ah, we made it. <laughs> so it was a big deal. But after we got to work every day at work, uh, we'd walk around, we were fixing these streets in, in Brooklyn, and we would walk around and look at the work, and um, I was the inspector, technically. I didn't know anything, but I was the inspector, and so I'd walk around like this, inspecting stuff. And every time I would ask him a question, he would say to me, what do you think, boss? You're the boss. He, he was, had a, a French accent, he was Haitian, and he would say, well, you're the boss, what do you think, Mr. Boss? And he would call me, sir. And uh, boss man, chief, captain. And he always treated me with respect. He always wanted to hear my opinion, even though I really didn't have an opinion. Um, and it was very humbling. As I've been looking through the characters in the Bible that we're looking at and studying this summer, David, King David, was one of the main people in the Bible you must learn about. And when I started considering what to talk about as it pertained to David, it was that he was a man of honor, that he respected people around him. And my challenge to you tonight as we look at this story in 1 Samuel is that you would become a person of honor. In other words, that the people you work with, you work for, you, that who work for you, your students, your teachers, your family, that as a Christian, they would know you as someone who honored them that you respected them, that you put their concerns and needs before yours. If there's one thing that non-Christians will look and pick up in your life more than anything else as a symbol of your relationship with God, it's how you treat other people. Not how much you come to church, not how much money you give at church, not how much ministry you're in, but it's how you treat them, number one. And so we're going to look at the story. We're going to pray in a minute. I want you to be praying about someone in your life that you're having problems with. Someone that you can be proactive in going to them and fixing the problem by honoring them, by forgiving them, by respecting them. More than you think they deserve. So let's all bow our heads and pray. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness to us and your goodness to us. We thank you that you love us so much you die for us. And Lord, I pray that you would challenge us in our heart, show us in our heart our selfishness, our pride, 
and how little we honor people. How often we may possibly walk on people, take advantage of people. We're not honest with people. But that you would reveal in our heart, Lord, how we can be better Christians in loving other people, especially those we don't get along with, especially those that we have a problem with, those who have hurt us, irritated us. Teach us, Lord, to deny ourselves, pick up our cross, and follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. In this story, it's about two men. Everyone say David. Say Saul. Saul was king. David was not. David, Saul was acting king. David had been anointed king, but he was going to take over later. And in Saul's life, Saul was a bad king. He messed up a lot of times. And God had told David, you are going to be king and take his place. But before that actually took place, God started to raise up David as a very powerful military leader. The people loved David more than Saul. When they would come back from military campaigns, they would say Saul killed thousands but David killed tens of thousands, yet, David, yet Saul was king. So Saul started to get jealous, and he basically decided, I'm going to kill David. So on two occasions, he threw a spear at David, tried to kill him. One time, he sent him out on a military expedition, a uh, military campaign that was very dangerous with the intent that David would die. He gave, Saul gave David his daughter and said, if you want to marry my daughter, you have to go out and get a hundred foreskins from 100 Philistine men, hoping it would kill him in the process. So he was try, constantly trying to kill David, and he hunted David like a man would hunt an animal. Well, in this story, David is running from Saul with his 600 men. And Saul hears that David's in these caves, and he says to his 3,000 men, let's go get David and kill him. And David happens to be hiding in the cave. Saul, by accident, goes into this cave to either take a nap or relieve himself, whatever. We'll see in a minute. It says tend to his needs. And he's in the cave, and David's men says, now you can get him. You can kill him. God delivered your enemy into your hand. Now, in the world, you go kill him. He's tried to kill you. He's betrayed you. He's talked behind your back. Get him back. And in our world, we are taught by the world that if someone gets you, you get him back. They talk about you, you talk about them. If they rob you, you better go get it back. You got to pay them back. You got to come out on top. But in the Bible, God teaches us something different many times. He says, I love your enemies, don't hate your enemies. When someone talks about you spitefully, you love them back. Very opposite. It goes against our carnal nature. It goes against everything we're taught. It goes against everything we do. Christians are not necessarily this way just because they're saved. You have to consciously and intelligently and... Uh, um, deliberately say, I am not going to pay people back evil with evil. I'm going to love them. And that's what David did. So we're going to look at that in, in the Bible here, how to honor people. First, it says in verse 1, chapter 24, it says, It happened when Saul had returned from following the Philistines, that it was told him, saying, Take note, David is in the wilderness of Engedi. Saul took 3,000 chosen men of all Israel and went out to seek David and his men in the rocks of the wild goats. Now, we went there to this place in Engedi, the rocks of the wild goats, and they're basically cliffs that almost go straight up. And these little goats with their little baby goats are walking and running up on down these cliffs. It's amazing because they're just like, they'll step on a little tiny ledge about an inch. And in these cliffs, or on, the, on the cliffs are these caves, and that's where they're going. This is right next to the Dead Sea, very hot. And it says in verse 3, he came to the sheepfolds by the road, where there was a cave, and Saul went in and attended to his needs. David and his men were staying in the recesses of the cave. Then the men of David said to him, This is the day which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand, that you may do to him as seems good to you. So David arose and secretly cut off the corner of Saul's head. Okay, just making sure you're paying attention. It's his enemy. Go kill him. He's tried to kill you. He's hunting you to kill you. Go kill him. He goes and cuts off his robe. What's up with that? Verse 6, 5. It happened afterward that David's heart was troubled because he had cut off Saul's head, I mean robe. Just checking. And he said to his men, 
the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master, that the Lord's anointed, to stretch out my hand against him, and seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. So David restrained his servants with these words and did not allow them to rise up against Saul. Saul got up from the cave, went on his way, and David rose after, afterward, went out of the cave, and called to Saul, saying, My Lord the king. And when Saul turned around, David stooped to his face and bowed to the ground. The first thing I want you to write in your lesson plan, it says, establish a basis for honoring others. Establish a basis for honoring others. In other words, why should I treat my enemies like that? Why should I treat you with respect? Why should I not try to take care of my needs first? Why? Your lesson plan. Philippians 2, verse 3. It says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look not on your own interests, but also on the interests of others. The Bible tells us that we should do nothing through selfish ambition. Nothing. Nothing. That we should esteem others better than ourselves. What does that mean? Does that mean I say you're smarter than me? You know what it means? That instead of looking at your faults so critically, I'm going to look at my faults. Because you know what? I know my faults better than I know your faults. Even though we don't think so. Have you ever heard somebody say something and you think you know what they mean? And then you not only judge what they really said, you, you start to judge the intent of their heart, why they really said it, what they were really trying to tell you, why, how, why they're so evil, and you put them to judge, jury, and you convict them and send them to prison based on one comment, and you don't even know what the heck you're talking about. We do that. And instead of looking so critically at other people's thoughts, other people's actions, other people's words, other people's mistakes, people make mistakes. Instead of being so critical of other people, we should say, you know what? I'm going to first look at my own faults. I'm going to first acknowledge that I'm sinful, that I'm critical, I'm judgmental, and I know my heart better than I know their heart. And I'm going to deal with my issues first, and I'm going to esteem them better than myself. And when, it, when, when someone's hungry, if you're married out here, how many people are married? Raise your hand. If I can see you. You know what the Bible says? You should love your wife like you love your own body. You know what that means? When you're hungry, assume she's hungry. When you're tired, assume she's more tired. When you're thirsty, assume she's thirsty. And instead of saying, honey, get me a drink, say, honey, what kind of drink do you want? And then say, when you get mine, get yourself that one too. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> I couldn't help it. I couldn't help it. Oh, that was good, huh, fellas? Huh? <laughs> it's only a joke. It's only a joke. The Bible says that we should consider one another to stir up love and good works. What does that mean? That when I encounter you, when you encounter her, when she encounters him, your first thought should be not what can I manipulate this person to do for me, not what can I get from this person, but how can I help them obey God? That's biblical love. How can I help you obey God? That's what it means. Let nothing be done to see what I can get. Let me see what I can do to help you. Ooh, that is hard. That takes effort. That takes humility. That takes prayer. That takes faith. But that's what the Bible says. And look what Saul, look what David said in verse 6. He said, the Lord forbid that I should do this to my master, the Lord's anointed. These are, what he, these are the names he called him. My master, the Lord's anointed, the anointed of the Lord. In verse 8, he says, my Lord, the king. At the end of verse 10, the Lord's anointed. At the beginning of verse 11, my father. He saw Saul as God saw Saul, not as his frustration saw Saul. When my sister started dating, she was a teenager. I knew a little guy, she was, you know, trying to, take her out, and I knew what they were thinking. And I would call them all aside when they would take them out, and I would, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I said, when you go out with my sister, I want you to think of this. 
I want you to remember that she is not your girlfriend. She's my sister. Amen? She's his daughter. He has a gun. <laughs> my father was a cop. And when my sister eventually got engaged and I think married, my, my brother-in-law would stay over the house. My father would take out his shotgun and lean it up against the bed. Like, stand it up. It was nothing in it, but he was, and it was a joke, but he would tell my brother-in-law, just keep that in mind. Okay. He would never do anything to him. And, and, but the point is, is that when you look at her, remember that she is more than just what she is to you. She's his brother, her sister, their daughter, their grandparents. And when you encounter people, no matter what they've done, no matter what the issues are, understand this. God made them. God has a plan for them. And God, as a Christian, is going to use you in their life. That's your role. No matter who you encounter, when you encounter them, under what circumstances you encounter them, no matter who, as a Christian, God wants to use you to point them to him. 100% of the time. If you get robbed, God wants to use you. If your car gets stolen, God wants to use you in those people's lives. That's word. Next one. Number two, increase your scope of honor. Scope. The breadth of your honor. Look what it says in verse, not scope, breadth, not that. <laughs> Verse 5, the Bible says that David felt guilty for cutting Saul's robe. Look what he says in verse 5. Now it happened afterward that David's heart troubled him because he had cut off Saul's robe. And he said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing against my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch out my hand against him, seeing he is an anointed of the Lord. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait. Saul threw a spear at you twice, tried to get you killed, sent you over here to try to get you killed, put you in the front of the battle, try to get you killed, and you're worried that you cut his robe? He goes, yep. Because my heart is so sensitive. How far are you willing to go to avoid dishonoring and disrespecting somebody else? Now you heard people say, don't gossip. Well, I'm not a gossip. You may not be a gossip in your mind, but you sure will listen. And you sure will go, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I know what you're saying, mm-hmm. I ain't want to gossip. I ain't want to gossip. You ain't heard that from me. <laughs> you just gossip. Anytime you listen to gossip. You know, next time someone comes and tells you something negative about somebody, you know what you should say? Excuse me. I don't want to hear it. Do that. You'll be saying that all day long. Excuse me. You'll talk something. Excuse me. Because people cannot stop talking about other people and they don't know what they're talking about. That's not what God wants you to do. Go out of your way. Because even if you entertain gossip, you're guilty of gossip. You're putting f f uh, wood in the fire, making it worse just by listening to it. Just by listening to it. I have a friend of mine, and he, um, he just gossips all the time. And I'm not perfect, but that's one of, the, one of the pet peeves I have is I can't stand gossip. Not that I am never do it. I pray that I don't do it, but it's something that just irritates me more than other things. And I said to him one day, I said, you know what? Do me a favor. I don't want to hear any more of that stuff anymore. Because every time I talk to him, he's talking about this person. I said, D don't talk about it. And I noticed that when he sees me, the first few times after I told him that, he didn't have anything to say. How you doing? And he would go, um, um. and I would just sit there. I wouldn't bail him out. I used to look at him. So uh, what's happening? Um. You know what? How far are you willing to go? There's a friend of mine who lives here in San Diego who is a very successful man, um, business, et cetera, et cetera. And one of his neighbors is an elderly couple. Two or three times a week, the woman, the wife, would call him up 
at 2.30 in the morning and ask him to come over the house because her husband had fallen out of the bed. He couldn't get back in the bed. He was, he was very old. And so my friend get out of his bed, go over his house. He would lay on the floor, roll this man on his back, and put him in his bed and go home. That's, that's humility. That is amazing. I, when I thought about that, I just started thinking about when I'm like 123 years old and I can't get back in my bed and my wife feeling helpless to get me in the bed. To have somebody that would be faithful enough and humble enough that she can call any time to come put me in the bed. This man passed away recently. Can you imagine the blessing that that guy was to that family? You know what? Because he didn't have an agenda. He says, if I have to lose sleep to go bless that man, I will lose sleep. How far are you willing to go? Not listen to gossip? Not disrespect somebody? Say sorry, thank you, please? Humble yourself and say sorry to people? Thank you to people? Go out of your way to acknowledge something good that someone did for you? This is what I'm talking about. And you know when you do this, all of a sudden your pride starts to be erased and purified out of your heart. That's what David did. David, look what it says in, in, in your lesson plan. It says, abstain from every form of evil. Another verse, another version of that says, avoid the appearance of evil. Anything that is even close to dishonoring somebody, don't even go near it. And watch what God does in your life. Turn the page. Next one. It says, strengthen your foundation of honor. Look what it says in verse 11. David says, moreover, Saul, moreover, my father, see, yes, see the corner of your robe in my hand. For in that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you. Know and see that there is neither evil nor rebellion in my hand, and I have not sinned against you. Yet you hunt my life to take it. And look what he says. Let the Lord judge between you and me, and let the Lord avenge me on you. You know what he said? Saul, you can hunt me all you want. You could send 3,000 men after me. You could send all your scouts and your, your, your informants to find me. But let God judge. Let God judge. It says in your lesson plan, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says God. If someone is doing something to you, instead of you trying to get them, pray that God deal with it. God can deal with it way better than you can. There's a pastor in Chicago named Bill Hybels. He's a pastor of Willow Creek Church. It's one of the biggest churches in America, about 20-something thousand people. And he has an organization called the Willow Creek Association. They help churches organize themselves, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And some people believe that his theology is wrong, off, which is bogus, but they believe that. At least it's bogus to me anyway. And um, so he was at this conference talking to all these pastors. And in this conference, as he's teaching them how to run churches, et cetera, a man stands up and says, you're from the devil, your theology's from the devil, and da-da-da, you're ruining the church, da-da-da-da-da. And some people started to go over to shut this man up because they were disrupting the uh, conference and being disrespectful to the Bill Hybels. Bill Hybels says, um, let him speak. The guy said all he had to say to criticize him. And then he says, thank you. And he said, let's pray. And then when he prayed, he says, Lord, anything that that man says that is true, reveal that to me and I will repent. But whatever is not true, we pray that you would reveal that to him. But let the Lord decide. You don't have to argue your, your fights. You don't. Let God. Imagine if you can go to work and you didn't care who got promoted. In other words, it wasn't for you to get. It was for you to trust God to give you. Your salary was for you to trust God to give you. you who you were going to marry or who you were going to date, you would trust God to give it to you. And you didn't try to get it because when you try to get it, we go too far. Look at the limit date. I mean, give me a break. <laughs> give me a break. Whew. Do you say, God, you know what? If you want me to have that person, if you want me to have that person, you do it. But I am not going to cross the line. And David said, let the Lord decide. 
Saul, I got a whole list of reasons why you're wrong, but you know what? I'm going to let God decide. Next one. Honoring others is a binding commitment. Binding commitment. In other words, don't vacillate and be nice to one and not nice to another. Look what he says in verse 12. He says, let the Lord judge between you and me. Let the Lord avenge me on you. But no matter what happens, Saul, my hand shall not be against you. Ooh. Saul, you are not going to get me to stoop down to your level to do what you're doing no matter what. God. And let me tell you what the devil's going to do. He's going to send people into your life to press your button. And he knows what button you need to press. Someone's got a button here. Someone's got a button here. Someone's got a button here. You know what I'm talking about? In other words, you don't like people driving slow when you're in a hurry. You don't like people who talk loud or who have a whiny voice or who try to sell you stuff or who try to be too cute. Whatever it is that gets under your skin. Try to rip you off in the store. You know, just e e e e e. Devil's going to line them all up. This is your button. He's going to send 10 people in your life. Just press it. Say amen if you know what I'm talking about. They ain't going to press over here. It don't matter. They're going to press right here. And God's going to be there going, what you going to do? What you going to do when they come for you? <laughs> that is the test of your relationship with God. That is the test of your relationship with God. It's easy to love people that are nice to us. It's easy to be nice to people that we like. But it's the people that get under your skin, and we all have them. You know what David said? Nothing's going to make me break. When Jesus made a commitment to die for our sin, can you imagine if when they were beating him, he said, oh, I, I ain't know it was going to be like this. <laughs> Nail him to the cross. Oh, man, that hurts. Oh, forget this mess. Y'all going to have to go to hell because I ain't dying for nobody. I ain't dying for nobody. No. You know what he says? I'm not changing my mind. I'm not changing my mind. And lastly, in your lesson plan, honor has long-lasting benefits. Honor has long-lasting benefits. Benefits. Look at verse 16. So it was when David had finished speaking these words to Saul. And Saul said, is this your voice, my son, David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. Hmm. You know how you can get under someone's skin that's bothering you? Love them. You imagine someone coming to you saying, you're just a jerk. You're right. You just think you're all that. And a bag of chips. <laughs> well, that might be kind of prideful, but you can say, yeah, you know. You're just so prideful. I know. I pray for it all the time. <laughs> There's a lot of other things about me that are real bad, too, if you only knew. <laughs> the Bible says when you love your enemy, it's like taking heaping burning coals and putting it on their head. Burns them up. Gets under their skin. You don't do it for that reason, but that's the effect it has. And if you want to frustrate somebody, love them. Just do what God says. You're bulletproof when you do what God says. You're, you're beyond reproach. And so what, what happened? David says, I'm never going to lift my hand against you, Saul. And Saul, God's going to judge. What did Saul do? He started crying. And look what he says. In verse 17, he said to David, you are more righteous than I, for you have rewarded me with good where I, as I have rewarded you with evil. Verse 18, you have shown this day how you have dealt well with me, for when the Lord delivered me into your hand, you did not kill me. For if a man finds his enemy, will he let him go free? Therefore, may the Lord reward you, may the Lord reward you with good for what you have done to me this day. And now I know indeed that you surely shall be king, 
and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. The Bible says humility comes before honor. Pride comes before fall. You see those, air, those hot air balloons over there, Torrey Pines, wherever they come from. Before they go up, they're on the ground. After they go up, they come back to the ground. It's very simple. If, through your pride, you place yourself up, there's only one place you can go, down. But if you're in your humility, you say, God, I'm not putting myself anywhere. I'm going to let you do that. God will lift you up. Write your lesson plan, Proverbs 18, 12. That's half the verse right there. I guess, guess it got cut off. Before destruction, the man's heart is haughty or prideful. But before honor, he is humble. My challenge to you is to say, you know what? The best way for me to know if I'm humble is how I treat other people, especially those I have a problem with. We're going to take communion in a few minutes. When you take communion, it is very important for you to acknowledge that Jesus Christ humbled himself for us. The Bible says while we were sinners, not thinking about God, enemies of God, had our back to God, cursed God, he humbled himself and became in the form of a man and was crucified. Therefore, God highly exalted him that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. Two things. One, you have to acknowledge that Jesus Christ died for you and ask him to be your savior before you take communion. If you don't, don't take communion. But two, he did that as an example to us. The Bible says that he did not come to, to be served. He came to serve in the same way he has called us to not lord our authority over people, our intelligence, our money power, our influence, that we would take everything God has given us to serve other people. It is required and does require faith and humility. And it's something you'll work on to, to the day you die because it goes against our carnal nature, but it is what the Bible says. My challenge to you as the ushers come forward, my challenge to you is this week to say, Lord, I want to be a person of honor like David. And especially those people in my life that I got issues with. Some of y'all got issues with people. Tonight, you're going to have an argument. You got someone you want to call up tonight and tell them a piece of your mind. A piece of your mind that you couldn't say in church is that you would call him up, or maybe not call him up at all, but if you did call him up, you would say, you know what? I apologize. It's a magical thing. Even when you're 90% right, and they're, I mean, you're, you, they're 90% wrong and 10% right, you're 90% right and 10% wrong. In your mind. In your mind, by the way. Well, I really shouldn't say sorry because I really didn't do it. And they started it. And they, they said it five times. I only said it three times. And, and you know, it, they really should say, please, be the Christian and say, you know what? I'm sorry this happened in the first place. I'm sorry to even be involved in this. I'm sorry for whatever I did. Watch what God does. And if that could be your posture all the time, that you always esteem others better than yourself, you, one, would carry around so less, much less stress. How many of you, don't have to raise your hand, but think about it. How many of you spent nights laying in bed before you go to sleep, driving down the freeway, sitting in class, arguing with somebody in your mind? I just can't stand them. They, they just think they're all that. And they said this, and I know they really mean it. They said this, but they didn't mean that. And they, they just really hate. They think they, yeah, yeah, yeah. If, they, if I see them, I'm going to say this. And if they say this, I'm going to do this. I'm going to knock them out. And, and the police are going to have to come, and they're going to be on nine. I'm going to be on the cops, and they're going to be on TV. And I'm going <laughs> to. Amen? Yeah, look at all y'all. Evil, wicked. <laughs> you know how much energy that takes? You know how much stress that? You ever been in bed gritting your teeth? You're sweating. Maybe I'm the only one. Maybe I'm the only one. Imagine saying, you know what? I'm wrong. I'm going to apologize tomorrow. I'm going to I'm going to call him up right now. I'm going to wake him up. Yeah, I'll call him up right now. Wake him up. And get it over with. 
It's over. Do that this week. Be set free and stop letting the devil play you for a fool. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness to us. We thank you for David and his humble heart. You say he was a man after God's heart. He wasn't perfect in his behavior, but his heart desired to do the right thing. Lord, I pray that as a church, we would be servants, humble, honoring of other people, and that people would know us because of our humble servant's heart. Lord, as we prepare to take communion, there are people here tonight who need to receive you as their Savior. They need to really acknowledge that you died for their sin and rose from the dead for them. If tonight you need to ask Jesus to be your Savior before you take communion, pray this prayer with me. In the privacy of your heart, pray, Dear God, I believe that I'm a sinner and that my sin is wrong. I believe my sin has consequences. But I believe that Jesus loves me, that he died for my sin and rose from the dead. Dear Jesus, please forgive me. I surrender my life to you, my guilt and my sin. Please be my Savior and my Lord and my Master right now. As our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed, if you pray that prayer to ask Jesus to be your Savior, just slip your hand up real high. We can pray for you. God bless 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 you. Good. God bless you. Very good. I see you up there. God bless you. You can put your hands down. God bless you. Lord, we thank you. Seven days a week, 24 hours a day, you are willing to forgive people and cleanse them. Thank you. Thank you. Jesus' name, amen. 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 Uh, we're going to ask you to hold the juice and the cracker, and we'll take it all together in a few minutes after we sing a song. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my
for our sin in full. We thank you that you allowed sinful man to nail your physical body to a tree. And we thank you that you did it for us. Lowly man, sinful man, selfish man. We take this bread acknowledging that. We take this bread acknowledging the extent to which you humbled yourself, the extent to which we need to humble ourselves, that others may see you, experience you, know you, hear you, that we would deny ourselves, deny our comfort, our conveniences, our pleasure, our desires, our plans, that you may have your way through us. 
Lord, as we take the bread, remind us of that. You said, take, eat, this is my body. So we take, eat, acknowledging that this is your body. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, as we hold the cup of juice in our hand, we know that this represents your blood. You say that if we confess our sin, you're faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. Lord, honoring other people is very difficult. Seeing other people as better than ourselves is not natural. It's supernatural. We can only do it effectively if your blood cleanses us from unrighteousness. Lord, the wickedness of man is deep. The Bible says that the heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? And even those in the crowd who might say, my heart's not that wicked, they're just blinded from reality. We all have sin and evil and pride and arrogance and lustful hearts and wicked thoughts. Lord, we pray that as we take this cup, we will be reminded that your blood has the power and ability to cleanse us from those things. You can renew our heart. You can renew our mind. You can take thoughts of violence out of our life. Fits of rage and anger out of our heart. You can purify our thoughts, the intents of our heart. We take this knowing that this grape juice can't do that, but spiritually your blood can do it. We thank you for offering us the power of prayer, the power of a relationship with you. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. A couple things before we, if you pray to ask Jesus into your heart, we saw many of you, before you leave, right here in the middle of this amphitheater, there's a walkway, and there's people over here who want to pray with you. I want to challenge you as you walk out, make your way over there. Two, um, if you notice, there are about 20 people walking around serving all of you with the offering, the communion. Why don't you give them a hand and thank them for serving you. I want to challenge you as you come to church every week to notice the ushers that are there every week serving you. They get there early and leave late every week. And I want you also to notice that there are thousands of people that go to church here. And there's probably a bunch, thousands that would consider this their church that are not doing anything. I would challenge you to continue to challenge you to ask God what he wants you to do. If you look through the Bible, the Bible says he's given some to be apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, pastors, but it doesn't say churchgoers. It's not a spiritual gift. <laughs> it's not. So I would challenge you to say, you know what? I need to go usher, be a greeter, have a small group in my home, start a ministry, work with the children. So I want to continue to encourage you in that because as we grow and as we move to a new location, we're going to need hundreds more people doing things. And that's just to keep services going. Not, it's not to go impact the world. So I want to challenge you in that. And you can start this week by serving the people in your world, in your schools, your jobs, honoring them. See what kind of kind things can come out of your mouth. What kind of button pressing can you overlook? You have no agenda. We are nothing. David said, and I didn't read the verse, but he called himself a flea and a dead dog. He said, Saul, what, what are you chasing? I'm a flea, I'm a dead dog, I'm nothing. God is everything. So this week, try to get all the chips off your shoulders and say, you know what, I'm just going to be a servant. 
I am nobody important. I'm going to seem everybody better than myself. And watch what God does in your heart. When you go out of here in the parking lot, don't have to be the first one out. Someone cuts in front of you, let them go. What is the big deal? You're rushing home to do what? Nothing. <laughs> ESPN comes on every hour. As I, said. <laughs> I can tell you what happened. <laughs> you know? you I mean, I, I mean I, I'm an ESPN nut. I watch the same highlights over, like it's going to be different. Yeah. It's not. Just watch it one time. So let's do that. Let's stand and sing a song. If you raise your hand, please make your way over to the prayer area over there. And bring a friend next week. Amen? Who's the man tonight? Jesus. Oh, who the man? Who the man?